They say after saying no, why did you do this? Okay. Um, to move the uh, the test back to to Monday. Uh, so what's going to happen is, um, but we're not going to lose a day of instruction because we're going to flip flop um, Friday and Monday. So tomorrow I'm going to uh, start the next section. Obviously not on the test. Uh, start it on the next section and. Um, but hopefully it won't take a full period. I can also review um, for the test tomorrow. So tomorrow um, uh, morning, I will have a health session, 715, and also another health session, 715 in the morning. So um, uh, I'm just gonna be working through um, additional problems from the packet, but then also um, I can also create some similar problems for us to work on. Okay. Any uh, any questions about packet or about the um, the schedule? Uh, another thing I want to make sure, um, and I will try to send this out in um, a text for mine today, is uh, uh, on my website. I put out a list of. Um, Topics. Let me just uh, see if I can share. Okay, so I haven't changed the, the date of this on the website, but I will. Um, here are the, uh, the, the, the topics uh, for the test questions and uh, for the test on Monday now, and I will uh, send out a reminder about this. So you're going to get one derivative graph, uh, which uh, we're going to finish up today, um, and we'll try to get in a practice problem within tomorrow. Um, you'll get one optimization problem. Um, It'll be um, uh, one involving um, uh, minimizing cost or finding the uh, uh, optimizing cost uh, for uh, a rectangular box. Okay. So I think we'll have time to do one of those problems as well. Uh, there will be one um, curve sketch problem. Okay. Uh, we'll do that at the beginning of class today. That's where I gave you the original function, and you have to go through the first derivative test, create your sign line, your, your test for concavity, sign line, and then creating the sketch of your graph based off of your arrows and your um, curvatures. And then you'll have three problems uh, related to topics from the 3134 quiz, such as so uh, the problems may involve EBT, mean value theorem, roles, first derivative test, or second derivative test. Okay, so um, there's only three problems that are new um, on the test, but the other three problems will be something that topics that you've already um, learned from the 3134 quiz. Okay. All right, and I will update uh, the websites uh, to reflect that the test is on Monday, because um, tomorrow we're going to start notes for uh, 5 1 and 5, uh, 5 1 um, parts A and B. Okay. Uh, you will get to use your calculator. Any questions about uh, the test right now? Okay. Let's go to page eight. And let's do this full problem here. First derivative test, concavity test practice. Uh, let's uh, 
finish, let's uh, do this problem in, um, in full, and then I'll go back and now we'll review uh, the derivative uh, graph problem and finish up the graph problem with the second derivative function. So uh, let's let's get this um, number eight here, page eight. Uh, the key is a few pages after this, but just see how much you can get um, just by working through this process, right? So uh, go ahead, go ahead and find your derivative, critical points, slow sign line, find your relative max, relative min, uh, write out all your because statements, find your relative max, relative min, find your order pairs, second derivative function, critical point, point of inflection, sign graph. And then once you have your two sign lines, then you can begin building the sketch of your graph um, based off the arrows and the and the concave up concave down that you see. OK, so try that and I will uh, uh, go through um, the problem once you guys have a chance to try it. Okay, um, hopefully find this pretty straightforward. Uh, nice polynomial, um, easy to find those critical points. Relative max, relative min. Uh, careful uh, that you're writing your because statements exactly the way that is presented here. Uh, we want to be losing these points that are easy to uh, to earn, right? Now make sure you name the function. Uh, don't say it changes or the sign changes. Um, you want to name that function that you are referring to. Uh, we can also find these order pairs because we can insert our x value back into the what? The original. original, yeah, the original because we're now looking for a physical location that we can plot onto our graph. If I uh, find uh, the graph at two and the graph at zero, uh, I can find those y values.
after you, after you have your uh, first derivative a, B, C, and D figured out, then move on to the second derivative function. Right, so if that equal to zero, find those critical points. There's only one point of inflection uh, because when we solve for x equals one, this one is still acting as a candidate, right? We haven't confirmed that it's a point of inflection until we actually uh, place it onto the sign line, test the signs, and recognize that there is a change in sign, which will then um, update, upgrade that candidate to a full point of inflection. Right? So now there's confirmation, there's point of inflection, there's actually a, a sign change on the on that second derivative sign line. And then if I want to find that order pair at one, I can insert one into the original function, just like how I did relative min and relative max. Once I have those X values, they all go back into the original function uh, to go where we can plot onto our graph. Okay, any questions there? OK, so now let's practice uh, sketching the graph. Um, looking at it, um, the only thing we need are the order pairs and the sign lines. Okay. I'm going to start off with the order pairs here. Order pair 2, negative 1. Pair zero three. Uh, another order pair is point of inflection at one one. Okay, and we're going to create. Uh, we like to. I like to create two versions of this graph so that I'm not trying to do too much at once. Um, just looking at my slope sign line, just to uh, get those arrows, the direction of those arrows to to match up with what I want to see on my graph. My graph is going to be always increasing all the way up to zero, which means that it'll be a relative max at zero, just like how the arrows are presenting to us, uh, decreasing all the way to, down to two. After two, it's going to rise up again, so there's a relative min at two. And right now, I don't care about the curvature. I just want to get that path um, figured out. Okay, so now I can go back to my... Um, uh, my second derivative sign line and actually fill in the details on the curvature of my graph. I know my graph is going to be concave down shape all the way up until that point of inflection at one. And after one, the graph is going to turn back to concave up. But I don't want to veer too far away from my dotted line, right? The dotted line kind of gives me some, some uh, restrictions, some structure, so I'm not trying to overdo it, right? If I'm completely off my, my dotted line graph, I know something didn't go quite right. So that kind of helps us make sure that we're in line uh, when we sketch our graph. All right, any questions there with um, number 10, uh, with page uh, page 10? I'm sorry, this is less to here, page eight.
Okay, let's go back to page um, seven. And um, uh, we did this full practice problem almost to the end, um, but we didn't quite get to finishing up the second derivative graph. Okay, so um, let's look over um, problem, make sure that we are clear with the steps, because you'll see a problem like what we just did now, and also you'll see a problem like this one here, where I gave you the derivative graph and I'm going to ask you all this information about the original graph. OK, so the derivative graph here, right? This is uh, the, the graph problem that we did yesterday. Uh, we know that our X intercepts are going to be your potential relative max relative min above the X axis, positive slope, below the X axis, negative slope. And then we have to also be able to translate this derivative graph onto a concavity sign line. And we said that the peaks and valleys of your F prime graph will go on your slope sign line, uh, your concavity sign line. Okay. These are your points. Of, your points of inflections are going to be the peaks and valleys of your derivative graph. And then now you look at the slope. Don't look at the shape. The shape of the graph is not matching with what we want in terms of the curvature, because this is not the original graph that, that we're trying to describe. So we look at the slope. The slope of the derivative graph is going to translate to the concavity. So I try to color code it here. Um, the negative slope from the derivative graph means a concave down for the original graph. A relative, uh, an increasing on my derivative graph means a concave up on my original graph. Okay, negative slope, concave down, positive slope, concave up. Okay. So how many points of inflection do we have? Four, right? Negative three, negative two, one and four, they all experience change of signs. So let's create our um, second derivative graph based off of just this sign line. Okay, so this is um, part I. So if I'm creating my second derivative sign line, uh, sorry, graph, uh, I'm going to uh, label uh, what I'm dealing with here. So anything on the x-axis are these are potential POIs, right? Anything above the x-axis are is where I'm going to experience concave up. Anything below is where I'm going to experience concave down. Okay. Okay. What can I place onto my Concavity sign line. All the points of inflections, right? They all go directly on my x axis. All right. We know the graph is just going to smoothly go through those dots, right? Those points. Um, uh, uh, the graph is just going to go through those, um, kind of weave through those points. Uh, but we got to uh, decide where we're going to start. Uh, so where is our graph going to start? Okay. Below the x-axis, right? Concave down. Let's look at the location. We want the location of the graph to be below the x-axis. But it has to rise up to this point, right? Otherwise, our graph is not going to be connected. So we're going to just make the graph rise. I know this may kind of go against what you see visually because you're seeing concave down. Shouldn't that be decreasing? OK, but just look at the location. Okay. All right, concave up means above the X axis, so it has to go up and loop back down. Right, I want this interval to live above the X axis, and that's what I have right here. Is there a difference the endpoints on this graph? Um, for this one, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to be picky about it with the second derivative graph, but yes, we can. But then again, we don't know exactly where that endpoint is, so um, uh, yeah, we can we can just give an approximation. Yeah, but on the original graph, uh, I do want that endpoint since it's identified, specifically identified. Okay, so we keep going right between negative uh, um, two and one. Our graph is going to dip below the x-axis. So we're just kind of weaving through our our um, x-intercepts here. 
um, between one and four above the x-axis since it's five k above, and then between four and four five decrease again. Uh, for H, we, we did sketch the full graph, right? Um, but again, I want to kind of remind us that when you do your original graph, you're doing two versions, right? Well, there's three things I want you to do. I want you to sketch the graph um, based off of your um, just your slope sign line, right? You do a dotted graph just based off of your slope sign line. And then you're going to, uh, wherever your graph lands, just highlight the points of inflection. All right, so negative three, negative two, one, and four. That way you can kind of have some target points so that you can know when your graph is going to achieve a change in curvature, right? Having those points uh, just kind of gives you a goal so that you know, oh, okay, I want to make my concave graph concave down this first interval and then switch over. Okay. It makes it a little bit easier. Um, to connect your dots and to make your graph more um, visible in terms of the changing uh, curvature and your concave up and your concave down. Okay, so you'll see a problem like this on the quiz, um, pretty much word for word the same thing. Maybe the, the graph will look a little different, but the steps that you take is going to be exactly the same. Okay, we ask you the exact same things as this uh, this problem here. Okay. Any questions, though? All right. All right. We'll try to squeeze in another practice problem like this tomorrow. Okay. Um, so you'll see a problem like um, what we did on page eight, which we just did. You'll see a problem like what we just uh, finished off with uh, page seven. Okay. And then you're also going to see a problem like the optimization problem that we worked on. So. We already did this, but on page 19, let's just see if we can do it from scratch, right? Can we, do we still remember um, how to build this problem? And the key is on page 20, but let's just do a full optimization problem. So these are the three extended problems you're going to see. You a function graph, curve sketching, a derivative graph, and then an optimization problem like this one. So page 19, go ahead, try and go along. We always did it in class, The problem says find the cost of the material for the cheapest container. So you see the word cheapest is describing cost. So we know that we're going to be uh, our primary equation is going to be with cost. But the thing we have to uh, understand is, um, you know, is that cost going to be paired up with volume or is it going to be paired up with surface area? Okay. The way that we know is we think about this problem and we say, well, we're not really paying for the space inside the box, right? We're paying for the material that makes up um, uh, the sides of the box. So we know that the cost is going to be associated with the surface area, right? So you read the problem. 
open top, which means there's only five sides. So you're going to add up the areas of your five sides. Once we multiply each of the areas, each of the sides with their appropriate cost, then we can eventually transition this equation into a cost equation. But every side is going to have its own associated cost. Is multiply the cost into uh, each of the areas. Let's clean up our primary equation. So do we need help with from a secondary equation? What do you notice about the right side of the equation? Two. Two variables, right? We should only be able to get it down to one variable so that we can cleanly find the derivative. So it looks like the easy replacement is that H. So we want to find a secondary equation that can help us remove that H in terms of X. So what other information is provided in this problem that can provide that can act as a secondary volume, right? So they do give us information about volume. So we can also build the volume of this box. What's the formula for volume? Length times width times height, right? Okay. We have a substitute for H. Now we can get our cost equation in terms of X. Now it's just a matter of cleaning up the expression, getting it ready for power rule, find the derivative, set equal to zero, solve for X. You basically just from here, just finding the critical point. Now, once you find, once you solve for X, that your, your, the calculus is done, but your problem may not be finished yet. Okay. But it does get a lot easier. Once you solve for X, you just, Deciding where does that X going to go so that I can present the answer that they're looking for. Okay. So see if you can um, get that cost equation cleaned up, find the derivative, find the critical points, uh, set the derivative equal to zero. And then once you solve for X, go back and read the problem and decide, OK, what do I need to plug X into so that I can um, present what the problem is asking for. But the hard part is up to this point, right? Once you get that cost equation down to one variable, then it feels like problems that you've done before in the past.
Okay, so once you make your substitution, um, you'll be able to see that you have 36x times 5 over x squared. Get that to clean up, multiply 36 and 5, uh, take out one of the x's, bring the x up to the top, and then you're ready for power rule. Okay, find the derivative by c prime, set c prime equal to 0, and try to solve for x. There's my derivative. Set my derivative equal to zero. Uh, bring both uh, equations, set the equation equal to each other, cross multiply, solve for x. I got it down to a decimal value. Um, so, what is the problem asking for us to find? Find the cost. So the cost, I just have to go searching for one of the cost equations, and you can see that there are five variations of the cost. Any of them will work, but I just decided to choose the one that I think is the easiest to plug into. But they will all give you the same optimized cost, $163.54. What if it asks you for dimensions? Well, um, what would you do? Plug into the ball. Plug into the Find the height. Uh, well, the dimensions is I want to know the length, width, and height. So I, if I know what x is, I have one part of the dimension. And then to find the, the longer uh, base, I can just multiply that 1.65 times 2. But then I also need to find what? Yeah, so so once you you know once you solve for X, whatever you need to find should already be ready for you, right? You shouldn't have to recreate anything. You're just deciding where it goes. Uh, so well, we already have a high equation ready for us to use five over X squared. So take that one point six five and turn for X, whatever that decimal value is, that's the height. So once you solve for X, in your optimization problem, it should feel like a much much easier problem. You're not quite done yet, but um, shouldn't do any, you know, everything else after that, you're just plugging to the calculator. You shouldn't have to recreate or build anything. Okay, um, let's go to test review uh, worksheet one. Uh, so this is in your packet on page. Uh, 11. We're going to skip number one and let's look at number two. Page 11. Number two. Okay, so take a look at number two here. It says the second derivative graph is given to us. Okay. Uh, a and uh, C are x-intercepts. B is the um, minimum. And it's asking for where's the graph, where's the original function going to experience concave up, concave down. So this is the second derivative graph. We have to understand that um, this is, the y-axis is not showing us the position, so this is not the 
the shape of the graph nor the location of the graph. It's also not telling us the slope of the graph, but it's telling us the concavity value of the graph. OK, so we can uh, let's we're going to create our concavity sign line, but we have to kind of understand how to interpret this uh, this graph here. So I like to label what I'm looking at so that I am um, kind of clear as to what we're dealing with here. So what can I um, what can I put here as a reminder? Anything uh, above the x axis means where my graph is going to be where I'll give up. Anything below is I'll get down. Anything on the x axis uh, is what? Point of inflection, right? So what can I place onto my concavity sideline? Which are? Uh, yeah, let's let's use the letters that it provides since that's what the answer choices is in terms of A and C. Okay. And then um, what's uh, what interpretation can we give to the left of A? Yeah. Now it looks like concave down, but what is this notation telling us? It's above the x-axis, right? We don't want to look at the shape of the graph. The shape of the graph uh, is for the original graph, and this is not the original graph. Okay, so concave up because it's above the x-axis. Between A and C, below the x-axis, again, don't look at the shape, look at the, the location. Okay, it's clearly below the x-axis. That's going to translate to a concave down. Okay, and then to the right of C, above the x-axis. Okay, we know there's point inflection at A and C because we see clearly change in signs on either side of A and C. Uh, and then sorry about these uh, zeros here. Um, that's not uh, a little typo there. So when is the graph going to be concave up? So left of A and to the right of C. Okay. Questions there. All right, we're not going to do number one. Um, so if you want to uh, put this, uh, I'm going to do two variations of this problem. If you want to put it in the space that you have above, you're welcome to do that, but we're going to just watch along here. Let's say I gave you a, another second derivative graph. Okay. Let's say it looked like this. And let's say I ask you for concave up, concave down, and points of inflections. Okay. Um, how would you create your second derivative sign line from here? Good. X intercepts. Okay. We can again label what we're working with so that we are clear. That we're not looking at the shape, we're looking at the location of these uh, points on the graph. So, what's the concavity behavior of the original graph to the left of one? Right now, because it's below the x axis. Between one and four, yeah. between four and seven, to the right of seven, down. Now, we see clearly. Uh, where all the intervals of concave up and concave down are. How many points of inflections do we have? Only at. One and. Seven, right? So. I do want to clarify something here. Your X intercepts are. Potential. EOIs. That's more accurate because just because it's on the X axis, it doesn't guarantee a point of inflection It has to cross from one side to the other. So we can see that for. There is no change in sign here, so four is a candidate, but it is not a point of inflection. POI only at x equals one and seven. Questions there? Okay, I have another variation I want to go through with you. Let's call this 2C. And now let's say I, I'm giving you F double prime of x is equal to 
x minus 1, x minus 3 squared, and x minus 7. Okay, and if I ask you for point of inflection, how would you go about starting this process? Right, set equal to zero, right? There's no need to find derivatives, right? I already got it down to second derivative. I already have it in factored form. So you just simply set equal to zero and solve for x. So set each parentheses equal to zero. X minus one gives me what? One. X minus three squared equals just positive three. And X minus seven gives me. Okay. So is that it? Is that my points of inflection? I still have to do what? Test it on the sign line, okay? Test it on the sign line. Now, it's possible that all three are, are um, points of inflection, but we don't know what the sign changes are until we see it on a sign line. Okay, so we choose values on in each of the intervals here. They all get inserted into the factored form. Well, that's the only one that we have. Okay, so. Uh, zero and for x here, this gives me negative. Zero and for x here, that gives me negative, but it's being squared, so it'll turn to a positive. And so from now on, I'm going to ignore that middle parentheses because it's always squared. So no matter what I put in here, it's always positive. So it's not going to help determine the sign for me. I'm just going to test the first and third one. So zero minus one is negative. Zero minus seven is negative. Two negatives gives me a positive. Okay, well. Insert two, two gives me positive, two minus one is positive, two minus seven is negative, positive and negative is negative. Okay. Insert four, four minus one is positive, four minus seven is negative, positive and negative is negative. Plug in eight, eight minus one is positive, eight minus seven is positive. So we have three critical points, but are all of them points of inflection? Only at one and seven, right? We stopped here. We would have named an extra critical point that it was that was not a point inflection. We have to get it down to the sign lines. So we can actually see whether there's a sign change. All right. Um, let's go to number uh, three. Okay, let's just yeah, let's just finish up with three, and then if we can't get to four, we'll we'll do some of that tomorrow. So number three says verify uh, that the function satisfies Rolle's theorem. So Rolle's theorem requires continuity, differentiability, and then the endpoints need to be the same y value. So uh, the nice thing with number three is a polynomial, so we know that we are good with the first two conditions. OK, but we also need to test the endpoints, right? So 0 and 4, we insert them into the original function. And what needs to happen if we want Rolle's theorem to, to apply? Yeah, the same, right? So they each get inserted into the original function. I saw some students do this on the quiz. They were plugging 0 and 4 into the derivative. They're doing f prime of 0, f prime of 4. So we don't do that for Rolle's theorem or for mean value theorem. Okay, so we never care about the slope at the endpoints. Okay, because that's that's not what uh, Rolle's theorem cares about. It cares about a slope zero. 
okay, between the endpoints. So if I plug zero in for X, I get negative one. Plug four in for X, I get 64, or I get um, 48 minus 48, plus 48 minus one, which is negative one. So that confirms it. These two graphs are directly across from each other. I'm, uh, hold on, I got this wrong here. Plus one, my bad. Oh, yeah. Okay, four one and zero one. These are directly across from each other. I know that between these two points, I can draw a horizontal line between it, which means that this is a guarantee. There must be a slope zero somewhere between, and we simply set f prime equal to zero and solve for x. Okay, the slope. Zero will go into the derivative slot of the equation. And we're solving for X. C equals negative two. All right, I didn't get a chance to do number four, but number four is a really good one. We'll um uh, we'll try to get through the notes for chapter 5-1 and then um, try to do some more review tomorrow. OK, but I will have a help session tomorrow morning, 7-15, Monday morning, 7-15. OK. Oh, sorry. Uh, did I copy this wrong here? Oh, sorry, my bad. All right, go up and get your phones. Sorry about that. It's hard to see. Yeah. Cool. You leave them. Um, uh, some problems like any time like the sign lines for like f of x like that like x or like derivative and then the same derivative. How do you know like when it's x equal to zero and when it's not x equal to zero? Because like you find x and then like when it's like equal to x. Yeah. Maybe um, like, for like page eight.